So I'm going to start off by just briefly saying what, what I do, because um, this is actually relevant to why I'm here. Um, I work for a venture capital firm, Battery Ventures. I've been there about two and a half years. And what I do is, one of the things I do is due diligence on deals, which means I'm the guy in the room who asks the awkward questions like, does it scale? And what language did you write it in? <laughs> and I kept getting this answer. <laughs> He rewrote this thing in Go, and it was, oh, this is over the last two years, two or three years. An awful lot of the new things that have been written in enterprise IT have just been written in Go. I mean, I'd say it's, it's gone maybe two thirds, three quarters, maybe 80%. There's stuff in Scala and things, there's existing code and there are people doing stuff in, you know, other languages didn't go away. But the new things, like Docker and is probably the best known example, but just lots and lots of things, lots of uh, service, service or, um, SaaS systems, things like that. So that was interesting. Um, what I also do is I support portfolio companies, network with interesting people like all you people. So if you want to talk to me about anything, I'll be here through tomorrow lunchtime, um, or th through afternoon and evening. Um, and then I tinker with technologies, and I started writing some code in Go because I was trying all these projects that people were doing. A lot of it was open source, and I was trying to understand. I was trying to read it, and I couldn't read it because I couldn't. So I had to learn the language to understand what I was reading. Um, and then I do, uh, I do some other stuff on the side. So I'm about half time at Battery Ventures nowadays, and through, you know, for the, through the summer, I'm spending some time consulting and training and doing things like that as well. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, this is basically half of a Papers We Love meetup. Has anyone here been to Papers We Love talk? You know what I'm talking about? There's a thing running around, lots of cities around, around the world, where you can go to a meetup called Papers We Love, and somebody digs out a paper that they like, and they talk about what does that paper look like, and what does it inspire in them, and how does it work, and all that stuff. And on Thursday in San Francisco, I'm going to do roughly the first half of this talk at a Papers We Love meetup. Um, followed by Paul Burrell, who's going to do Leslie Lamport's talk on time. And Paul told me that Leslie's talk was the second most cited paper in computer science, according to somewhere he found that out. And, he, and the CSP paper by Hall was the first most cited paper in computer science. So he wanted me to, you know, anyway. Um, I tried looking that up, and it came up with a bunch of different papers. But that's what Paul told me. Um, so I'll talk about that, and then I'm going to go off into like a few other papers. There's one on Occam from 83, Pi Calculus from 92, another paper in 2013 on the combination of Occam and Pi Calculus. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some work I did in 2006 that I translated into Go and what I did with that. And that's kind of we'll, where to get into that. So I'm going to start off with what is CSP? So here's uh, the paper, the original paper from 78 or whenever it was. Um, and one of the interesting things here is that it says it should not be regarded as suitable for use as a programming language. <sighs> it's a bit of a downer, really, isn't it? Um, so you can't actually get a compiler for this. If you write anything in CSP, you have to just stare at it really, really hard and decide whether it probably doesn't have any bugs in it, because there's no program you can get that will run CSP for you. So that's kind of annoying. But anyway, so here's the syntax, and there will be a test. Um, so all of you, I know it's after lunch, but you know, BNF. Um, I did highlight the interesting bits here um, in red. So you can see there are different kinds of commands, and there is a null command, which is interesting, because we had a talk on null, or nil, was it null? So there's a null command called skip. So skip is a new word for null. It's you call things skip, you know, right? Um, but there's input and output commands. And then for structure, it has alternative, repetitive, parallel, and a command list, which is basically sequential. And you know, obviously, you know, you can, obviously you're used to reading BNF uh, notation for languages. So I'll just go straight into it. And we saw prime number sieve in, in Go earlier this today. So here it is in CSP. Um, and each of the different processes in this, I did in a different color, so you could actually see what the hell was going on. Um, and there were, I told you there was a test, right? <laughs> this is the test. Um, so let's try and make sense of this. This is the structure of what we've got here. Um, there's civ0, which is a sending stuff in. There's civ1 to 100, which is an array of civs. And then there's civ101, which sort of tidies everything up at the end. And they all send stuff to this print thing, right? So print is the one at the bottom, and all it does. It doesn't actually know how to print, because actually CSP doesn't have any IO. It doesn't know how to print, so it just goes at that point, goes dot, 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 I don't know. This is taken from the paper, from the CSP paper. So print all the things somehow. Um, 
And you can kind of see the structure of it. And if you squint at it, I, I did some code on the right to try and show what some of those gibberish um, looking symbols meant. Um, anyway, so this is, this is an easier way of reading it. So when you're inputting from a process, you do question mark P. If you're sending to a process, you put exclamation mark P. Okay, or you, actually the other way around. Use, use the exclamation mark to write, so it's shout, right? Exclamation, exclaim, and question mark is read, okay? So that's fairly easy notation. You put stars around in brackets around something if you want it to repeat a lot, which is kind of hard to see, so it turns it into a for loop by just sticking an asterisk at the beginning. And then alternates, um, alternates are a bit weird. It's sort of like a combination of an if and a select and a case statement a switch statement all sort of bundled in together. Then there's parallel, and if the vertical bars, I coded that stuff in black, so the structure of this program is in the black text. So there's a bracket at the beginning and the end, a square bracket, and then two vertical bars for the, pip, for the parallels that show you how it's all stitched together. And then there's semicolons around here which show you, you just do things sequentially. So that's, yeah, it's kind of interesting, um, but it's kind of got some issues. So it isn't a full language, it's hard to read, and it's a talking to things by talking to processors. So you name the process you want to send a message to. Turns out that's actually not a good idea because it makes, it makes toy examples easy. When you try and build a bigger program, it makes composition and modules and things. It means you have to know the intimate names of everything you're gonna ever talk to, and it makes it harder to compile things and build things together. All right, so moving on a bit, there's this thing called Occam's razor, and I won't try and pronounce Latin, but basically entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. That's, that's Occam's razor. And David May wrote an Occam language, and this is basically as close as you can get to a pure implementation of CSP with one extra thing that it has channels in it. It has a few extra things, but it particularly it has channels. And it has this nice comment. This is the final line in the paper. I'll just read it out. Occam's intended to be the smallest language which is adequate for its purpose. However, suggestions for further simplification would be welcome. He's not asking for extra features. Right? Have we heard this somewhere before? <laughs> is Rob Pike in the room? <laughs> right. So, you know, um, yeah, we'd like to stick all these extra things in Go. No, let's just leave it. One of the nice things I like about Go is I've learned Go and I don't have to keep learn relearning it every year because there's a new version that adds a bunch of features. Um, so this is kind of the same kind of principle it was there, like let's keep this simple. It's hard enough building parallel programming systems and algorithms if you keep changing the, the language underneath. So let's just keep, let's concentrate on keeping it simple. So here's the, the talk, and this is interesting because he's talking about hardware. The reason for building this language was that they built a hardware, a, a thing called the transputer, a little chip which you could stitch together, and the chip didn't just have channels for, as a programming construct for talking between routines inside the chip. It had channels between the chips. It had links, and used exactly the same syntax to talk to an off-chip link as an, an off-chip channel as an on-chip channel. So you could actually create a, a, a program that was distributed across multiple machines with separate address spaces that just had point-to-point -point links. And back in the 1980s, I was playing around with these, um, and I learned the language, and I was actually built some transputer hardware and did a few things with that. So that's kind of how I got into pro this model of programming with parallelism built into it. So let's look at a couple of things. This is. Um, there will be a test, I guess, as well. The problem with this is that there is actually no extant compiler for this particular version of Occam. Um, it was written in Pascal, ran on VAX VMS, and I don't know if anyone has one of those, but this is from 1983. Let's just try and make this a bit easier. First of all, it's indent-based structure, kind of like Python. Um, the var and the variables, there's a colon at the end, and that basically, that colon binds those variables to be in scope for the following block, right? So that the, X, the v, going V and D, the colon, binds it to the sequence, and everything that's within the scope of that next sequence is those variables can be used. Um, then you just keep going around, and this is an out statement, which is like a select in Go, right? So you're trying to read from three different things. The first one is an input channel. You're trying to read a value from it. Um, and then you take D, and you set it to now plus 100. But now is a reserved word meaning the time now. So you don't have to do, you know, you don't have to import time. It's part of the language. It's a reserved keyword, just now, 
We'll all, yeah. and, oh, by the way, all reserved words are in uppercase, so that makes it easier to figure out whether, you, whether it's reserved or not. And then there's this interesting thing that you can wait after D. Again, two reserved words, wait. I can alt on a wait. I can select on waiting till after a time. So since I had it, so it'll just wait for 100 clock ticks, whatever that, microseconds or whatever it is, and then it'll output V. So that just acts as a delay loop. And if I want to stop it, I send anything to the stop channel, and any, again, is a keyword that just consumes a thing and throws it away. Um, and that going equals false. So this is an interesting little thing. It illustrates some bits of the language. And you can see, if you squint at it, you can kind of see how some things in this are sort of go-like, but it's, it's a little simpler and purer, and it's got a few other bits in it. Um, this other one, this pipeline, is actually similar to the, it's a very stripped down version of the um, prime number idea, right? And it shows a par, which is a parallel thing. And this is a little, I'll, I'll get to this a bit later. It's a little bit different to just saying go and then a function name like you do in, in, in Go. But what it basically does, it says, I'm everything in a par block. It's like a se sequential block, except every line is going to run as a separate thread. Every line of code in a par block is a separate thread. And I'm, when I get to the end of the block, I'm going to wait for them all to finish, like a wait group, and then I'm going to wrap up and keep going, right? So it's a built-in wrapped par wait group thingy, anyway. Um, and also, this is replicator thing. So you can replicate par and sequential and out and if, right? You just apply the replicator to that keyword, and you get an array of them indexed by the variable that you give it. So that's an interesting idea. All right, so here is that prime number thingy, except translated in OCAM this time. And you can see, I just call it Eratosthenes. And if you start this process, it will just emit uh, prime numbers on the output channel to you. Uh, that's kind of at least to get some kind of IO. So, that's um, interesting, but if, it may be a little bit subtle, but if I show you the, the structure of this, the naming is no longer the names of the processes like it was in CSP. The naming is the names of the channels that connect it together. So the structure you can see here in black is the sort of the code that's in black, I coded, I, I laid in black there. So the arrows, are, you know, all the networking, all the channels are decided to find outside this, and everything else is stitched together in parallel by the black code. And then the rest of it is the stuff that's running in the different uh, services. So that's interesting. Um, so channels behave a bit like distributed assignment. So I'm going to dig in a little bit and show you how channels work. So this is like a totally trivial piece of code. Um, all I'm trying to do here is y equals x, right? <laughs> why, would I, why would that be interesting? But we'll get to why it's interesting. And I just put the Go version of that, which again is trivial, right? So this is the real, really interesting stuff, right? So how does this actually work? There's the code. There's the program counter pointing at y equals x. And what I've already done is I've pushed x and y on the stack. And the way this executes is it, it's, think of this as this little stack machine. I pushed x, I pushed y, and then I do a copy between those two pointers. I push the address of x and the address of y, and then the copy opcode moves between those two addresses. So that actually is how it works. So this is, a, this is a deliberately simple example, right? Get that, maybe? It is just after lunch, I realize, I'm sorry. Um, one interesting point, the stack pointer is pointing at an empty memory location at all times, right? That's so that if you want to stop this process for any reason, you write the program counter at the current stack pointer, and you're done. All you have to do then is stash that stack pointer somewhere in the system on a run queue, and that process is now restartable by just picking up that stack, reloading the program counter from it, and keep going, right? So the entire process state you need is a single word, which is the stack pointer. Don't need anything else. And this was implemented in hardware. On the transputer, all of this stuff was done in opcodes in microcode on a machine running at 10 megahertz in 1985. So it's, it was done with not many transistors. All right, here's the distributed version of that. And I had a bit of trouble, actually. I th that little block on the right, that was about two hours <laughs> of me debugging and that playground. Why doesn't this work? Why doesn't it? Until I figured out how to get my defers and wake groups in the right place. Um, I thought it would be easy to replicate what was on the left, and it turns out it's a bit more complex. So 
you can see that if you basically start two threads in parallel and you write the channel on one and you read the channel on the other, that's a distributed assignment. Right? It's basically y equals x with a channel in between. And to do that in Go, turns out it's a bit messier than I'd like it to be. There isn't really a nice clean syntax unless I miss something and somebody can debug my Go and tell me what I'm doing wrong here. But fundamentally, what I need to do is start two functions in parallel, do write x into c in one, into the channel in one of them, read um, y out of the channel in the other one, and then wait for them both to finish and then print the result, right? So that's what par c exclamation mark x and c question mark y does, all of that code. All right, so how does that actually work? Okay, so now I have two program counters. One's pointing at the cx and one's pointing at cy, okay? So I've got two program counters and two stack pointers. And I've pushed x and y, I push c, and then what happens is the first routine that gets to the channel, the channel sitting there, it's just an empty memory location. The first routine that gets there says, I see, it does sort of a test and set thing. It says, I see nothing got here first. I got here first. I'm atomically going to write my stack pointer into the channel. And then I'm going to stop. Right? And then the second person that gets there has a look and says, oh, somebody else got here first. So I'm going to use that stack pointer to find the variable that they're trying to write, hook that out, copy it to where I want it to go, and then put that stack pointer on the run queue so it, keeps, so it starts up again, and then I keep going. Right? So this is my kind of internal mental model that I've had for years of how channels work. And exactly how they're implemented in Go is probably much more complex than this. But it's the, it's the essence of what a channel is. It can be a simple memory location. All you're doing is the first one that gets there parks. The second person that gets there picks it up, does the move, and keeps going, and reschedules. By the way, this is a single opcode on the transputer. It was done in hardware. It, that's one of the reasons this is a very simple implementation. Now, there are a whole bunch of reasons why a transputer didn't work. Part of, partly, what it, was, it was designed in England, and it's really hard to do microprocessor design firms in England. Um, we weren't in Silicon Valley. That <laughs> was the part of the problem. Um, sorry, I should get this out of the way. Um, OK. So let's, let's move on to something, that, uh, the next step here, which is pi calculus. And this is by Robin Milner and, and his buddies in 1992. And here's, here's the paper. We present the Pi calculus, calculus communicating systems. That sounds quite nice. But the interesting thing is it expresses processes which have changing structure. And this, this is what I think is interesting. This is kind of where I'm going. Yeah, you can have channels to stitch together a bunch of stuff. But what, how do you, what happens if you want to change the structure of your channels? You want to change the structure of your connections of processes. How do you deal with that? Um, and it goes into it in excruciating detail, in fact, so excruciating that I've just declared it to be a triumph of notation over comprehension. It's like, I don't make any sense of this whatsoever. This is a simple equation such as, um, no, it's <laughs> more general. It's easy to show that, um, whatever. I can't even read it. So anyway, so, but the idea that there is a formal syntax and a very set of proofs that say you can define a process model where the processes can dynamically change how they're stuck connected. That, that's the interesting thing that I'm sort of digging into here. So the people that were working on Occam eventually combined it with Pi Calculus and built something called Occam Pi, which is like all the stuff that was in that unreadable paper except written that nice, easy Occam syntax so that you could actually make sense of it, although it was, the concepts were a little interesting. Um, and then that happened over about 10, 20 years. And Peter Welch is at UK, University of Kent at Canterbury is one of the key people here. And this paper is a really, really nice paper. It, it's got a history of languages in it. Here it is. It's, um, it's lighthearted. It doesn't have too much math in it. It's, just, it's, it's got lots of examples of algorithms. So this, this is the paper you should go away and study if you want to discover some interesting parallel algorithms that you could probably translate into Go fairly easily. Um, okay, so I was playing around a little bit in 2006. I was at eBay and I was playing around with eBay Research Labs and we were trying to build a simulator for a peer-to-peer -peer network. Or we were trying to build a peer-to-peer -peer trading network. And I ended up coding a simulator for it in Occam Pi 
Um, what actually happened was, I, it was, I think it was Thanksgiving, and I was driving along, uh, driving along and suddenly realized, you know what, I could write a simulator for this in Occam. And I'm driving, and I'm thinking, you know, I, I think I could get hold of a copy of Occam. And I went and found a copy from University of Kent at Canterbury. There's a thing called Croc, uh, which it just runs on Linux and Macs and things. I got it, I got it running. And I came back after Thanksgiving and told my, the manager of the research labs, I just wrote a few thousand lines of code in a language that I think was written before you were born. <laughs> uh, nobody else knows. And he went, great, write a, write a paper. I got a, my only ever published IEEE paper was, is based on this, is this paper here. Um, so very briefly, this is, the, this is what I built. It was a... There's a super, it's like an actor-based framework. There's a supervisor who is connected to everybody and sort of sets it up. And then the, the nodes in the network create arbitrary connections between themselves dynamically using this language. And you create a network. This thing on the left is, a net, is the, one of the networks that it produces when you do it. So that's what a peer-to-peer -peer network looks like. It's like everything's connected to everything else. And there's a bunch of Occam Pi code here. And it has, one of the keywords here is mobile. And a mobile type is one of the essential things in Pi calculus, in Occam Pi. So the idea that you can take a channel and you can have a mobile channel and you can send that channel over a channel to somewhere else where you can do something else with it. So the idea that channel endpoints are mobile is baked into the language. And the thing that makes this language hard is that it's so hard to get anything to compile. The language, the compiler for Occam Pi is the most picky thing you've ever seen. It's like, it, it, you, it, was, it took me forever. But once it compiled, it basically worked. It's one of those things where the language has an enormous amount of type checking and also usage checking. It won't let you do anything that could possibly be wrong in parallel languages. It's an extremely deeply understood set of theories about what, is, what should and shouldn't be possible in this language. Anyway. I'm not going to go into that anymore, but let's, let's get onto this. So let's try and get this and move it into Go. So about a year and a half ago, um, I, I was looking at Go. I wanted to learn how to write something in Go. And I thought, well, I have this code in Occam that sort of looks a bit like Go if you squint at it because it's got channels and things in it. So let's see if I can do that. So I basically ported that whole framework for generating peer-to-peer -peer networks from Occam Pi to Go. And it generated you know, diagrams that looked a bit like those. And you can run it. And it's um, on, uh, it's on uh, GitHub. And I just have you know, And you run it. And basically, you say, oh, oh by the way, I should have pointed out here, um, the flexible simulation manager's icon is the flying spaghetti monster. Just to think, um, if people don't, you have to look up who what a flying spaghetti monster is. And then the Renoodles connect to a lot of pirates, and there's a whole lot of terminology that's taken from the flying spaghetti monster lore. If you and if you're not into that, go look it up somewhere. Um, anyway, so there's the FSM is the supervisor that, and the architecture that you can run in this little program that I called Spigo, um, and you can just run it for a second or so, a couple of seconds or whatever. Um, and so on my laptop, on this laptop, right, I can start 100,000 threads, processes. I can send half a million messages to them, and it takes a few seconds, and then it finishes. Right? So I, you create these th processes. You send them. Actually, there's four configuration messages. There's a hello message and a, a bunch of other messages that go. They, they get named and whatever. And then finally, there's a goodbye message that makes them terminate, and then they reply back. So I think there's three configuration messages and a terminate pair that, that's on here. So it's five messages per pirate. And the Flying Spaghetti Monster creates 100,000 pirates. And it runs in four seconds to just create them and shut them down. Now, unfortunately, every version of Go that I've used has got slower. And I was just kind of, if somebody can help me figure out why it's doing that, I'd be very happy to. To do that, so this you, I colored it in red. So using 4.2, this is Go 142. It took two and a half seconds, so that's about 200,000 messages a second, and then it got slower, and you know, 3.6 now. And Go is supposed to be getting faster with every release. And something about channels and the way that I'm you know, and the synchronization and, and scheduling is obviously getting a bit slower. Um, and then. 
I have actually run CPU profile, and there are profiles sitting on the GitHub account. If someone could show me how to use the CPU profile and make sense of it, I'd be happily spend like the rest of the afternoon doing that. So that's my call for help, right? <laughs> Maybe we'll find out something about in inefficiencies in Go to do with the channel system. Um, yeah, so why is Go getting slower? So let's think. <laughs> Go Pi, maybe, I don't know. Um, I tried to find a Go Pi thingy, and th this is near, is Raspberry Pi? It's the wrong kind of Pi. Well, it sort of is the right kind of Pi, but it shouldn't really have raspberries in it. So I need, I need, an, I need an icon for Go with a Pi or something. Anyway, so here, here are the things that I've built. These are building blocks that you might find useful if you're trying to build some kind of actor-based simulation networky thing out of Go. First of all is this pattern for building dynamic channels, dynamically rerouting things and building channels. And then there's an actor pattern for what does an actor look like when you write it in Go. And then a service registry I wrote, so actually think you can dynamically uh, discover and forget services, these little Go routines effectively as a service registry, and then some stuff on logging and tracing. So the dynamic protocol, so this is what it looks like. I've got um, go to call is the package name. There's a, thing, there's a type called message, which you can see here. And when I create a literal copy of that message, um, I have a thing say a get request, and then I, the listener, the listener is actually a channel. And then I say, now the timestamp it, there's a context in there, and it's not the same as a Go context, it's a much more lightweight thing. Um, and then the string, whatever the question was that you were trying to get, you know, the get request in this case is just the question why, because it's a good question. Um, and then if you look at this struct def definition below, the key thing here is this response time, response chan, the second field, is of type chan message. And this is baked within a, a struct of type message. So this is kind of like a linked list. You have to refer to the type of the list in the linked list. This is kind of a chained channel. So what it means is that if, as long as everyone is listening to channels of type message, I can send endpoints to you in a message where say, I can tell you where somebody else is. I can stitch the whole thing together dynamically by passing channels around over channels to you, and then you remember where they are and who to talk to, and now you know how to talk to another one of the messages, right? So that's, this is the, the, like the neat trick, right? And you know, maybe bit, I haven't seen this in other Go code. Maybe I haven't looked hard enough, but it's, it's a, that, this is the, co the core of this trick. Uh, the naming scheme I, had, I used here was from, um, Promise theory, um, so you can blame um, Mark Burgess for impositions and intentions, that's all his fault. Um, so an imposition is, is that I'm not requesting something, I'm imposing something on you. So that's, I'm imposing a get request on you. Uh, and my intention is the payload, so anyway, I just decided to use those names. Um, and these are the different protocol bits. My phone is being very annoying, stop it. There we go. Um, Okay, so those impositions here, these request types, this is all the request types I def I've defined so far. And if you need to add a new request type, you just add it here and then figure out how to handle it. So the first thing is, hello, right? So you have, a, you have one of these, these bits of code and it sits there and it listens. And the first thing it, that it ever expects to get is a hello to tell it what its name is. So the supervisor tells each node what its name is as the first message it gets, so like a birthing ritual here, your name is blah, right? So that's the, that's the handing down of the, of the name. Um, then there's this thing called name drop. And this is the key routing protocol. So a name drop message contains a channel to a buddy, right? It's like me, t if I told one of you Dave Cheney's Twitter handle, now you can tweet Dave Cheney, right? So in my message to you, I can take, you know, if I tweet to you somebody else's Twitter handle, you can now tweet to them. And in fact, if you start reading the Pi Calculus paper, the, there's a bunch of diagrams. This is about the only comprehensible part of the whole paper, is a bunch of diagrams explaining how you pass around these things. Um, so that's the key thing. I just called it name drop because I'm just name dropping somebody to somebody else. And all of the dynamic routing happens by name dropping people around the system. Um, 
There's a bunch of other things about wake, how often you want to wake up and do something. Um, but there were pirates. The pirates obviously need to give, do things, so they give each other gold coins. So that's why there's, and originally this was a trading network and people were buying and selling things. So I have gold coin in here as a thing. You can send people gold coins and, if you want. Yeah. Uh, the, pirate mess, the pirate nodes know how to do things with that. They collect them and send them to each other. Um, and then what else? There's an inform thing which is about telling somebody where to log things to. So you can have multiple different loggers, but the place you're going to log data to is sent to you as an inform message. Like, please inform this person when you do something, right? Then I have a get request, and it's a one-way request, so there's a get response for the return direction, and because there's no callbacks in here. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention this earlier on. Um, for those of you, there was a bit of a joke this morning about functional programming. I just wanted to point out that the original Occam language had no functions in it. Functionless programming, right? It only has processes. If you want to get something out of a process, you have to have a channel and read it out of a channel to get it back out of that process. This is the total opposite of functional programming, whatever, for whatever that's worth. So, it, and, and the PyCalculus paper shows that you can actually implement all of Lambda Calculus as a subset of, pro, of, of PyCalculus, although the math for that was one of those horrific things that I was showing you. Um, OK. So I've got get request, get response as kind of a pair. And I've got put for putting things in. Um, replicate, so when I put things in, sometimes I want to sideways replicate them, which is a different handler from put. So think of replicate as a, as a variant of put that I needed. Um, and then you can forget things. Um, so you can, you can name drop somebody. Then I can say, please forget how to talk to this other person's Twitter handle. You remove it from your, your little local routing table, and now you no longer know how to talk to them. So forgetting is in here. Uh, and delete. So you can remove, um, you, know, uh, you know, it's crud, right? So we've got get, put, delete. Um, and then goodbye. And if you get a goodbye message, you're supposed to quit. But before you quit, you reply back saying, I acknowledge that goodbye, right? That way, the supervisor can reap everybody. And when everybody has finally replied to the goodbye message, it then can quit. So this is, there's this thing called the halting problem in computer science. And I have suffered from the halting problem repeatedly with this program. It's like sometimes it just won't stop. And sometimes it generates stack traces. And when you've got 100,000 threads or even 10,000 threads, there's, a, there's just like stack traces scrolling up the screen for quite a long time. So it's, it's kind of annoying when it crashes. I th that visualizer from before lunch, I need that, right? And I went and looked, and he hadn't open sourced it then. So, and I was thinking, maybe over lunch, I could implement the visualizer for this. No, it's not, no. so at some point, I that absolutely have to do that. OK, so there's little bits and pieces of different protocols. And I could, you could implement different protocols, but I basically have everything I do understands this one message protocol, and I built on top of that. So what did the actors look like? This is the basic actor pattern. You have a start function that has a listener, and that's the only thing it has. There's no extra stuff being passed in. There's no extra configuration when you start the function. You say, I need 1,000 pirates. Start all the pirates, and they will all have a separate listener channel, and I will give them individual names over that channel, right? So this is all sort of eluded out to try and fit it on the screen. So the base, this is the canonical structure. You have a select. You read from your listener channel. You instrument that uh, to c collect how often it happened and how the response times and things like that. There's actually, it's histogramming uh, the, a lot of times and things in here. And then you do a switch on the imposition, which is that request type. And then you just go through all the different things that you could ask this actor to do one by one. And there's a hello thing. There's a name drop thing. There are standard handlers for those, so you don't have to write out the code over and over again. But this one's an interesting one. So this is a request. And when you get a put, so I put something in, and I've decided whenever I get this data, I want to replicate it somewhere else. So you can see the incoming message is a put. And what I do is I send out a replicate with the same payload. Um, and I generate a new parent for my context. So this is actually a, a Zipkin-compatible end-to-end tracing protocol, uh, tracing system. Um, and then I go send the messages. And then if you notice this other thing in select, it says case Eureka ticker. So this is a ticker. It's waking up every now and again. And what this is doing is polling the service registry. 
So let's have a look at that service treasury. And if you know Netflix OSS, the service treasury is called Eureka. That, so my naming scheme for this is a mixture of Flying Spaghetti Monster and Pirates and uh, Netflix OSS, weird names from there. So I'm sorry. Um, so here's, here's the code for Eureka, or part of the code for Eureka, one of the interesting bits. And let's just kind of look at this. This is a little bit different because I'm using the service registry to name things. So in this case, I, I, the supervisor, the, thing, the only thing it starts is the service registries. It explicitly starts a set of service registries. So I do pass the name in here because I, don't want to, I, I have to get an explicit name. And I I've got that kind of, you know, I can't use a thing to do a thing. It, it gets recursive, right? So the, this thing has got a full, an, an instance name is given to it there. Then the structure looks roughly the same except that when it gets a get request, it now goes and looks in. It's, it's got a little array of microservices that it's looking in, and it goes to try and find things that match that component. So it's rummaging around, looking for something, and then it finds it, and it says, OK, did you, you're, you're asking to find a specific, all of the instances of this generic name, right? So let's say you have, let's just think, think of this. Don't think of this as tracking web servers or something like that. I've got web server one, two, three, four, and five, but I'm just saying, give me a web server. So what you're looking through is the list of web servers saying, trying to find, I've got web servers and I've got API servers. Well, I only want the web servers. So every time I hit a web server, I'll go tell you about it. And what this code does is it responds back to the place that requested with a series of name drop messages for the things that it's seen. Right, for, the, for, for these new requests, right? So you send it a get, and it responds with a bunch of name drops that basically instantiate all of your ability to go talk to all these people, right? Now, that would be inefficient if it happened every time. So if I've already told you about this thing once and it hasn't changed, it, does, it just doesn't send any messages. So the first time you request it, it sends messages, and it just doesn't send anything and the, until, it, until there is actually a change somewhere in the list of, of instances. Right. So this is a completely dynamic system. New things can register, and they will be reported, and then it goes reasonably quiescent. But it's a polling-based system. You could actually build a simulation that would be a bit more like Zookeeper, which is, a call, which is a, you know, explicitly push-based. Push but this is a pull-based service registry. Um, this works remarkably well, considering it was mostly written above 30,000 feet you know, on an airplane. You know. <laughs> Most of this code was written when I was on a plane somewhere. <laughs> Right, mostly with a few glasses of wine. Um, so just to give you some idea what the code quality is likely to be like, right? But it does seem to work most of the time, so that's pretty good. I'm happy. All right, so what else could this Golang Actualize simulator be useful for? And I'm going to switch now to a few slides, which you, if you've seen me talk before, you probably have seen this in some of my microservices talks. Um, there are these microservices everywhere, and they have trouble figuring out how to show request flow. And these are the architectures of most some common microservice systems. Um, and they're too hard to visualize, and it's just messy, and it's, hard, it's, it's too difficult to get tooling to actually rep represent these very large, complex systems. So I built this Spigo tool to be a simulator for microservices. So it started off as a framework for peer-to-peer -peer pirates trading gold coins. And then I repurposed it, and it's all within the same code base. You can start pirates if you want. And sort of they're kind of end users to this system. Um, but you can start the microservice back end as well. And that back end, basically, I mean, there's a little diagram here that shows an example of what it looks like. You've got an endpoint, some load balances. It's pretending everything's running on AWS, running in a region or multiple regions. So the naming scheme I use for each of these little nodes, each of these Go routines, the name they're given is basically as a name that was as if they were running on AWS. And I actually fake in some IP addresses. So they have a fake IP address as well. So every one of my Go routines has an IP address which I stole from AWS. I used some of the public AWS address ranges. So you get a valid AWS IP address back out of this simulator. And you can use that to stress test monitoring tools. And if you want to go to simianvizsearch.sh, you can play around with some of the diagrams. So how do you define these architectures? Um, well, I ended up with a JSON format. Um, for dealing with this. By the way, why doesn't Go do YAML natively? <laughs> I've got three different YAML parsers, I think, in my code base at this point. Um, but anyway, 
I spent a whole weekend trying to figure out how to just parse a, a Docker Compose file. Anyway, because um, I thought Docker Compose would be written in Go because Docker is, but no, it's written in Python. So anyway, minor problems. But so this is how you define the architecture. You've got one row per tier, and you've got the dependencies over on the right. So that shows you that, the, for example, the web server has a dependency of the memcache and the MySQL, and it generates something. And when you run that, when you need to run it for about two seconds to generate more data than I could possibly visualize. So that's nice and efficient. Um, so this is what a run looks like. This is for the LAMP stack that I just showed you. And you can see it just loads the architecture, runs through everything, trundles through, creates it, runs for two seconds. Somewhere in the middle, it deletes one of them. So if you see it says victim, web server, OK, halfway through every run, one of the web servers will be told to go away, it'll be deleted, or told to basically have a chaos monkey killing one of the nodes. It's not really implemented that cleverly, but you can see in there chaos monkey delete. So it gets rid of one of these services, which is LAMP US East 1, Zone C, Web Server 2. Um, and it shuts down. And you can see I have three Eurekas, one in each zone for each region. So every simulated zone has its own service registry. So this is a distributed service registry. And the service registries actually cross-share information amongst themselves. right? And then when I have multiple regions, I have distinct service registries. And so I have this, the service registries in zone in, in the east region, the west region are separate. So I've got lots of these little service registries. And that gives you a scoping for who knows about this service. I can say, give me all the things, but I will only get the ones that are in my zone or in my region. Okay. Here's a more interesting architecture. This was for a, a conf I went to the React conference, and it looks like this. It was a, based off a, a reference architecture they had for uh, React. This is what it actually looks like. Um, lots of different services. Each of these little circles, colored circles, is a Go routine. Each of the lines on this graph is a channel. They're dynamically stitched together, and it writes out a, 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 a graph file which describes this, which you can then visualize. And then it also sends traffic through the system, which collects traces. So if I do tracing, this is a put request going into React. And then at the bottom, it gets replicated into the other nodes in the region. right? So there's, there's put, 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 and then there's two replicates. So I end up with three copies of my data, because that's how React works. right? So that's, and this is using the standard off-the-shelf Zipkin tool that was built by Twitter originally, which is used for end-to-end -end tracing. And the reason you can tell this is running in my simulator is these are microseconds. <laughs> you cannot do this in the real world with Java apps running across real networks. I'm sorry. <laughs> but in, this system is running about 1,000 times faster than real life and about 1,000 times smaller than real life. And I can run 1,000 know, large in networks of systems on my, machine, on my laptop. Right? That is why this is interesting. Um, I can then just say, please run a two-region version of this, or a three-region, or a four-region, and it just gets more bigger and more complicated, and eventually you can't render the thing because it's too hard to see. So a few months ago, I went to a conference, sat in a little workshop, and somebody showed me how to use Neo4j. So I added that to it. So now there's an option here where you basically do minus n, and it writes it to Neo. And then your visualization turns up in Neo, and you can try and figure that out. But the nice thing with Neo is even though the entire graph is now stored in the graph database, I don't have to visualize it all in one, one at a time. I can actually pick out individual pieces of it with, with Neo queries. And I can also write the trace flows into Neo as well, and I can pick out a particular trace. So this is an end-to-end trace of a GET request picked out using the Neo query there. So. Um, this is basically it. What I'm able to do is create really, really big, interesting graphs of a dynamically varying Go routines. I think that's somewhat interesting. Um, and stuff it into Neo. And then I'm also trying to hook this up to some monitoring tools to break them at scale and break them at speed and be more dynamic and more interesting. So my conclusions here. I've got a few minutes for questions coming up. CSP was just too limited to be useful as a language. I mean, you could make little thought experiments in it, fragments, but not more than that. I, just PyCalculus, just the syntax was just incomprehensible. It wasn't really useful. So Occam Pi, you can look at that as a way that these things were made much easier to deal with. And there is actually quite a large literature of algorithms written in Occam Pi, which may be interesting to go look at. The Go syntax, it, it can be made to work. I'd say it's clumsier than I'd like it to be. 
with having to do weight groups around things and stuff like that to build fairly simple constructs. But it does work. It's, it's complete. Um, it would be, you know, be some nice to have some syntactic sugar to make this kind of programming work a bit nicer. Um, I think there's some interesting GoPy idioms there. Um, hope, let me know if you think they're interesting. And I think this whole idea that you can pass channels over channels is something that I, I think could be something people might want to use a bit more. And then this active-based simulator is incredibly efficient. It runs in very little memory. The, if you're trying to build simulators, the best thing you want is a simulator that is very small and fast compared to the thing you're simulating. Right? That is really important. So the ability to do something large and quickly and, and, and run it quickly on a laptop means it's very, very easy to deal with. All right, up for some Q&A. Anyone got any thoughts on that? Wake up now. The, the, lunch, the lunchtime snooze break is over. <laughs> Anyone? We can just go for some more coffee five minutes early or something. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll be around. Oh, somebody there does want, we have a question. All right. Um, thank you. That was an amazing talk. Uh, it's a bit hard to take all at once, but uh, I can definitely see some interesting uh, uh, ways to simulate complex networks. For example, those steps in the protocol you described, are they part of the, uh, how was it, uh, the dynamic channel processing, or they are just uh, something you use for, for that specific simulator you are writing. Can, can you vary those states, that, those commands, and uh, would that be useful, basically? Um, so the protocol itself, I mean, it's compiled. So it, the protocol only understands the types that are compiled into it because you've got to react to the types. So basically, you're sending little request messages, and there are request types. So think of it as like HTTP. If somebody invents a new verb on HTTP, you'd have to go and change, you know, people that need to respond to that verb would need to recognize it and then have a handler for it. So what I've got here is a very compact representation of a, I mean, you could rewrite this whole thing using the Go HTTP handler stuff and all the interfaces. It would just be much more verbose and much more heavyweight. The, the just having a select go directly to, okay, I'm just a few lines of code here. I can pick this message up, pick it apart, respond to it, send something on. Right. There's, I've skipped over a few, it, you know, there are some difficulties in this system. It is, it, I wouldn't really be able, right at this point in its development, be able to build a really useful application in it. What I can do is build something that's topologically equivalent to a real system, and I can exercise it in ways which will make it look like there's a real system there doing something. But it's actually, when you actually try and code it to build a thing, it's, there's a little bit more complexity in, in how you want to do it. In particular, um, this, the con it's important to get the, the context stuff right in, in there, and there's, I've been working on getting some things going here. Another question? I think we have time for one more. One more? Question. Okay. Um, quick, question, quick, quick comment and a question. Um, the reason why the compiler got slower was because they switched it from being in C to in Go, and 1.7 had an SSA backend, so it should be a lot faster. There's been like a 30% speed increase, I think. In one seven. So you're thinking that one seven should speed up the, it the should. between the C and the Go. Yeah. Uh, and one quick question also: Have you looked at doing this as, as a network process instead of just being a simulation all in one box, breaking it out so you're actually making network calls to fake out, not build a full service, of course, but quick I, simulations? I, yeah, I looked at it. Um, I think um, Solomon Hayek published LibChan, which is basically a Go channel with an external socket that you could hook up to another one. So I could sort of glue sockets and channels together over a wide area. Um, this thing runs 100,000 nodes in two gig of RAM, okay? Uh, so AWS just announced a machine with two terabytes of RAM. <laughs> okay, so that means I could go to, what is that, 200, two, whatever that is. Put, put, put another six zeros on the end. I can't, my, I can't do that math standing up after lunch. Uh, <laughs> So I think you, I, and actually, there, I don't see any reason why this wouldn't just scale up to excessively large amounts of memory um, with enough threads running. It currently, it uses whatever cores you've got. I have a command line option to turn off a few cores if you wanted to run it. The thing I'd really like to do with this is a few unfinished things. I have a whole list of um, issues on my 
um, on, on my GitHub account of all of the ideas I've had that I haven't got around to implementing yet. But one of the main ones is that I'd really like to have an active user interface hooked into this simulator so I can see what it's doing in real time. And the next things I want to do to it are to add like code pushes, like red green push code and auto scaling. I could simulate lambda in here, so I could have lambda fun you know, single fun single shot functions appearing and disappearing on a lambda supervisor, um, and also simulate all of the chaos ar cha simian army chaos types. So I could have uh, take out a zone, take out a region. And I can simulate that happening in the simulator, and I can generate output as if it was happening in the real world, connect that up to a real monitoring tool like Datadog or something, and have, it try, have Datadog try to decide, or whatever tool it is, try to decide what's going on in the simulator as if it was happening in the real world. So that's the stuff I'm playing around with and um, very slowly hacking away at uh, ideas. And I've had a few contributions from people, but if anyone wants to go play with this, we'd be very happy to help you get started with it. All right, thanks very much.